Since antiquity, Europe and the Mediterranean world has had a great appetite for exotic goods from the east, much of which came from the somewhat vaguely defined region that came to be known as the Indies, which seems to have encompassed pretty much all of South and Southeast Asia. Within the Indies, you have India, which of course refers to the Indian subcontinent, and the East Indies, which refers to roughly what is now Indonesia. And these exotic goods from the East that were so highly sought after included silks from China, pearls and other gemstones, cotton, sugar, Chinese porcelain, dyes such as indigo. The Romans were particularly fond of exotic animals such as elephants, tigers and rhinoceros, both so that they could see them in the circus and so that they could kill them in the arena. But the most prized luxury goods of all were without doubt the spices. I'm talking pepper, cinnamon and cloves from the Indian subcontinent. Cassia from China, ginger from Southeast Asia, nutmeg and mace, which actually come from two different parts of the same plant, came all the way from a small group of islands in Indonesia, and I'm not talking Sumatra or Java, I'm talking about the Banda Islands, an archipelago of 10 tiny volcanic specks in the ocean, with a total area of just 46 square kilometres, that were, until the mid 19th century, the only place on earth where the nutmeg tree thrived. Not for nothing was this archipelago known to Europeans as the Spice Islands. And this is just to name a few of the spices that were said to be literally worth their weight in gold. All of these exotic goods reached the Mediterranean via a network of far-reaching trade routes, the most famous of which is undoubtedly the Silk Road, which was actually several interconnecting trade routes that together formed the overland link across Central Asia to China. From the 5th century, one of the natural European endpoints for this overland trade was Constantinople, or modern Istanbul in Turkey. This was due in part to the fact that Constantinople was by this time the centre of the Roman world and the greatest city in the Mediterranean, but also to the fact that the city was situated at the literal crossroads of Europe and Asia. Various other ports in the historical region known as the Levant, which included what is now Israel, Lebanon, Palestine and parts of Syria, also greatly benefited from their position as endpoints for the overland trade with the East. However, just as goods could reach the West overland, they could also do so by sea. What is sometimes known as the Maritime Silk Road connected the Mediterranean world to Asia by way of India, the Red Sea and Egypt. Now, by the 14th century, Christian trade in the Mediterranean was dominated by the various Italian maritime republics, foremost among whom was Venice and Genoa. Goods from Asia would arrive in Constantinople, the Levant and Egypt, and the Italians would then transport them to their respective cities in Italy, where they would then be carried overland into Central and Western Europe and beyond. Unsurprisingly, control over this extremely lucrative trade made these city-states both incredibly wealthy and intensely disliked by those European states that were entirely reliant upon them to satisfy their demand for exotic goods and spices. The Venetians in particular came to dominate the spice trade. Spain, and more pertinently for this story, Portugal, were particularly keen to find an alternative means of accessing the spice trade, and by the 15th century, these two rivals had been pushing each other in a contest to extend their influence down the west coast of Africa. In the middle of the 15th century, this contest was given fresh urgency by events in the eastern Mediterranean. In 1453, the great city of Constantinople finally fell to the Ottoman Turks. This represented not only the final death of the Roman Empire, but also triggered a chain of events that would usher in the dawn of a new period in the history of the world. This was because once they captured Constantinople, the Ottomans effectively severed one of the major overland routes to Asia. Though the spice trade was not cut off altogether, as the other Levantine ports and the maritime trade routes through the Red Sea were still open, the volume was significantly reduced, and what had been expensive before became affordable for only the very wealthiest of European society. As a result, suddenly the race to find a sea route to the Indies began in earnest. Now by far the most famous of these efforts is without any trace of doubt the 1492 Spanish expedition that was captained by a little known Genoese sailor by the name of Cristoforo Colombo, known to history as Christopher Columbus, who proposed to reach the Indies by sailing directly west across the Atlantic. Of course, there was just one problem. There were a couple of continents in the way. On a side note, Columbus's initial belief that he had indeed reached the Indies is the reason the indigenous peoples of the Americas were initially referred to as Indians, 
However, while Spain's eyes were focused westwards across the Atlantic, Portugal instead looked to the south, searching for a way to navigate around Africa to reach Asia from the west. In this regard, King John II of Portugal, an individual posthumously known as the Perfect Prince, and nicknamed by his royal contemporary, Queen Isabella of Castile, as simply the Man, was particularly determined, and during his reign, exploration of the South Atlantic was his main priority. In 1456, Portuguese ships had reached as far south as the Cape Verde Islands, which they subsequently colonised. Soon after that, they reached what is now the Gulf of Guinea, at John II's direction, in the 1480s, Diogo Cal doggedly made his way southwards from Guinea, erecting stone pillars known as padrales along the coast as he went, each one claiming a new discovery for Portugal. And in 1485, he reached what is now Namibia. However, the great breakthrough came in 1488. Bartolomeu Dias was off the coast of what is now Angola when he was blown by a violent storm far out into the Atlantic. At some point soon after, he caught an eastward flowing current that actually took him past the southern tip of Africa. It was only when Diaz and his men sighted land to the west that they realised that they had actually rounded Africa, and it was only on the return journey that they discovered a rocky promontory that they aptly named Cape Storm. After their return to Portugal, King John renamed it the Cape of Good Hope. Now you might be thinking, all of this doesn't sound too hard. You just have to keep sailing south until you round the Cape and then you're on your way to India, right? Wrong. In reality, even reaching the Cape of Good Hope was far, far easier said than done, chiefly due to one obstacle that men could do little about, the sea itself. The first part of a journey from Portugal to the Cape of Good Hope might not seem too difficult, but once you reach the Gulf of Guinea, you're about to hit a massive snag. A snag that goes by the name of the Benguela Current, which forms the eastern boundary of the South Atlantic Gyre. And the question that probably just popped into your head is what the hell is the South Atlantic Gyre? Now I know you came here for history, but I'm about to learn you some oceanography as well. Unexpected knowledge, the best kind. A gyre is an oceanographic term for a large system of powerful circulating currents with comparatively calmer waters in the centre. It is easiest to think of it as an enormous rotating donut of four strong sea currents and powerful winds. There are many gyres in the world's oceans, but there are only five major ones. There is one in the Indian Ocean, the North Pacific, the South Pacific, the North Atlantic, and the South Atlantic. And each of these gyres spans the breadth of their respective oceans. On side note number two, the ocean gyre is the reason why we have the phenomena of things like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, because the strong currents gradually push the floating garbage into the calmer waters in the middle, where the flow isn't strong enough to keep them apart, so you get a steady accumulation of floating garbage with nowhere to go. Though the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is the most well known, there are similar garbage patches in the South Pacific and in the South Atlantic as well. Anyway. The South Atlantic Gyre flows in an anti-clockwise direction, with the Benguela current forming the eastern boundary as it flows up the coast of southern Africa, and thus presents a serious obstacle for anyone attempting to sail southwards. By the 1480s, the Portuguese actually already had extensive experience dealing with the North Atlantic Gyre. Flowing in a clockwise direction, the North Atlantic Gyre makes life easy when making a trip from Portugal to the Gulf of Guinea as its eastern border, the Canary Current, flows swiftly down the coast of West Africa. However, the current that made life easy on the way down also makes life extremely difficult on the homeward journey, as anyone attempting to sail northwards is doing so against some of the most powerful currents in the world. To overcome this seemingly insurmountable obstacle, the Portuguese developed an ingenious navigational technique known as the Volta do Mar, which literally translates as Turn of the Sea. This involved sailing from Cape Verde somewhat counterintuitively in a north-northwesterly direction, all the way to the Azores Islands in the North Atlantic Gyre, more than 1,600 kilometres, or 1,000 miles, west of Lisbon. From there, ships could catch the eastward-flowing Portugal current back to the Iberian Peninsula. It was Bartolomeu Dias who realised that the technique developed for the North Atlantic might also be used in the south. He concluded that in order to reach the Cape in an efficient manner, one had to perform a Volta Domar and sail far out into the South Atlantic from Cape Verde 
and then swing eastwards to catch the South Atlantic current all the way past the southern tip of Africa, thereby bypassing the troublesome Benguela current. When John II of Portugal died in 1495, his somewhat disgruntled nobles might have thought that the kingdom could now finally turn its attention from far off exploration to matters closer to home, such as crusading in Morocco. Unfortunately for them, John was succeeded by his nephew, King Manuel I, whose dream of reaching the Indies was just as clear and ambitious as that of his uncle. It was Manuel who commissioned the preparation of a new expedition beyond the Cape of Good Hope. Though he would not command it, Bartolomeo Diaz was brought in to advise on every aspect of the expedition, from the design of the new ships to the navigational methods that were going to be used. All of this preparation paid off in 1498, when, ten years after Diaz first rounded southern Africa, famed Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama successfully performed a volta do mar in the South Atlantic, rounded the Cape of Good Hope, and made it all the way to India, and back. At long last, 2,000 years after it was first hypothesized, the ocean route from Europe to India had been found. And it should not be underestimated just how great a navigational achievement this was. It was a round trip of more than 37,000 kilometers, or 20,000 nautical miles, half of which was essentially uncharted for the Portuguese. Particularly once they reached the Indian Ocean, da Gama and his men knew nothing of the currents winds or hazards through which they were navigating. They were stricken by disease, running dangerously low on food and water, and the climate was oppressive. Even the ships began to rot from spending so long at sea. And none of this is to mention the fact that they had almost no idea about the political landscape in which they found themselves. They did not know the languages or the customs, and any of the ports they discovered could be hostile, particularly due to Muslim dominance of trade in the Indian Ocean. This last point was made worse by the fact that the Portuguese themselves didn't exactly conduct themselves with a huge amount of grace and respect. It was more like ambition and arrogance. It is because of all this that I would argue that though da Gama's expedition is far less famous than that of Christopher Columbus, it was actually more impressive a feat, and ultimately just as consequential in relation to the course of history. Subsequent Portuguese expeditions also succeeded where Columbus had failed sailing beyond India and discovering the sea route to the East Indies through the Malacca Strait between the Malay Peninsula and the island of Sumatra, which remains to this day one of the most important shipping lanes in the world. Within a few years, the Portuguese dominated the European spice trade. However, it wasn't a complete monopoly and the Venetians in particular were scrupulous in maintaining their trade links with the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt during the 16th century even encouraging the Sultan to act aggressively to purge the Portuguese interlopers from the Arabian Sea in the years following da Gama's arrival. Though the new trade route was long, arduous and dangerous with a high rate of attrition, it nonetheless had the advantages of not being beholden to the politics of intermediary states, and it allowed the Portuguese to transport spices in quantities that dwarfed that of their Venetian rivals. Indeed, it was said that if you took a stroll along the dockside in Lisbon's harbour, you could literally smell the spices. But most importantly of all, it was Portuguese only. No one else had the knowledge required to successfully use what became known as the Cape Route. The development of the Cape Route also resulted in an unintended discovery a few years later in 1500, when Pedro Alvarez Cabral sailed a little too far to the west while attempting a volta do mar in the South Atlantic, and instead hit the coast of what is now Brazil, which he promptly claimed for the Portuguese crown. Later, after colonization efforts had begun, Portuguese ships would typically stop in Brazil for resupply on their way to India. Now, the Portuguese were utterly ruthless in their pursuit of control of the spice trade, and over the next 15 years, led by the formidable Afonso de Albuquerque, regarded as perhaps the greatest Portuguese naval commander of his day, they obtained by military force a string of strategic fortresses and outposts throughout the Indies, most notably Socotra near the mouth of the Red Sea, Ormuz at the entrance to the Persian Gulf, and Malacca in the Malacca Strait. All of these fortresses allowed the Portuguese to tighten their grip over maritime trade in the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea. But most importantly of all, Albuquerque conquered the island of Goa on the west coast of India, thereby making the Portuguese the first Europeans to gain a foothold on the subcontinent 
Albuquerque famously boasted, what the Portuguese win, they never give up, and Goa would remain in Portuguese hands until it was annexed by the Republic of India in 1961. In the space of little more than two decades, the Portuguese had smashed an economic ecosystem that had remained largely unchanged for centuries, and in doing so, radically altered the geopolitical landscape in the Indies. For the next hundred years, Portugal kept the details of the Cape Route a closely guarded state secret. Of course, over time, details of the route inevitably leaked out, and the veil of secrecy was a frequent target of foreign espionage activity. Nonetheless, what details did emerge were not enough to fully decipher the secrets of the Cape Route, and, for many who watched with envy as spices flooded into Lisbon, they had no way of confirming if what they had gleaned was actually true in any case. This is not to say that no Europeans other than the Portuguese or Spanish managed to reach Asia. After all, it was Sir Francis Drake, the famous, or infamous depending on your perspective, English captain, explorer, trader and pirate, who in 1580 completed the second circumnavigation of the globe. However, Drake reached Asia by sailing across the Pacific Ocean, as Columbus had originally intended, and he rounded Africa on his way back to England. So, even after nearly 100 years, the Portuguese still maintained a monopoly on the Cape Route, and there was nothing to indicate that this was going to be changing anytime soon. As far as most Europeans were concerned, they had merely exchanged an Italian domination of the spice trade for a Portuguese one. With that in mind, it is at this point that I would like to introduce a man by the name of Jan Hauken van Linschorten. Hailing from a relatively obscure background as the humble son of a notary in the Netherlands, Hauken was a Dutchman in the service of the Portuguese. He was employed as the secretary of the Portuguese Archbishop of Goa, and he spent five years in India, from 1583 to 1588. During this time, he kept a fastidious journal, recording his observations of life in the settlement and the interactions between the city's European, Indian and Asian residents. However, by far his most important activity during his time in India was his use and abuse of his position as the Archbishop's secretary to access maps, nautical charts and other navigational information that the Portuguese had managed to keep a secret for almost a century. He meticulously copied highly classified maps and charts that detailed nautical features such as currents, hazards, winds and navigational landmarks. He also recorded details of the trading conditions of the various regions, who to buy goods from and who to sell to, and observations regarding the best means of bypassing Portuguese controlled sea lanes. In short, Hauken copied everything one needed to conduct a successful expedition to the Indies, and he did it on his own initiative and without the Portuguese realising until it was far too late. Upon his return to the Netherlands in 1592, Hauken set about compiling all the information he had gathered into a single book. When the book, titled Travel Accounts of the Voyage of the Sailor Jan Hauken van Ningschoten to the Portuguese East India, but often simply known as Itinerario, was published in 1595, it, along with the works of noted cartographer Petrus Plantius, changed the course of history. Within a year, a Dutch expedition departed for the Indies via the Cape Route, carrying, amongst other things, a copy of Itinerario. Thanks in large part to Hauken's efforts, this enterprise succeeded where previous attempts had failed, returning to the Netherlands more than a year later with enough spices to offset what had been a less than smooth journey and make a handsome profit in the process. Of course, further expeditions quickly followed and the genie was well and truly out of the bottle. And it was not just the Dutch who now sought to cut in on the spice trade. The translation of Hauken's book and additional information gleaned from Dutch experiences led to the departure of an English fleet to the east in 1600. However, this particular expedition was not just another run-of-the-mill private enterprise. It was the first expedition on the part of a private corporation known as the Honourable East India Company, or EIC, which had been granted a royal charter by Queen Elizabeth I that effectively gave it a monopoly on all English trade in Asia. This meant that it was actually illegal for an Englishman to trade in the Indies if he was not employed by the EIC. Two years later, the Dutch followed the English example and established the Dutch East India Company, or VOC, 
Other countries, such as France and Sweden, would eventually establish their own East India companies, but it was the EIC and the VOC that would effectively challenge the Portuguese. For their part, it soon became apparent that the Portuguese were unable to keep up with these new interlopers. While their trade with the Indies was a crown monopoly, overseen by the royal Casa de India, the Dutch and English were nationally chartered, but ultimately private enterprises. They were funded by stock investment and essentially harnessed the growing financial might of a burgeoning merchant class. Now, as touched on earlier, the rate of attrition for their journey to India was very high. It is estimated that in the first decade after da Gama's expedition, 30% of all who made the journey perished, shipwreck and disease being the most common causes. However, if the attrition was significant, so too were the rewards. To give you an insight into the financial rewards that could be achieved through trade with the Indies, a Dutch expedition that departed in 1598 and returned in 1600 produced a return on investment of not 150%, not 200%, not 250%, but 400%. And yet even this is utterly dwarfed by the reward obtained by Vasco da Gama's original expedition. Troubled though it was, the return on the original capital investment was supposedly almost 6,000%, no doubt a result of inflated prices due to a shortage of supply. Indeed, within five years of da Gama's return, King Manuel was said to have been making, and this was after expenses, over a million gold cruzados per year. Not for nothing was Manuel nicknamed the Fortunate. In short, Though there would certainly be peaks and troughs in investment, such were the financial incentives that there was never going to be any real long-term shortage of capital for either the EIC or the VOC. In the long run, the Portuguese simply could not match the resources of these corporations, and though they would remain active in Asia until the 20th century, their influence in the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean steadily declined. Soon enough, it was the English and the Dutch having previously joined forces against the Portuguese, who were vying for dominance over the spice trade in the East Indies. Ultimately, it was the Dutch, better organised and far better financed, who would emerge triumphant out of that struggle, and their victory would eventually lead the VOC to transition from a purely commercial enterprise into a territorial power in its own right, securing control over the entirety of what is now the Republic of Indonesia, which was until 1949, known as the Dutch East Indies. Pushed out of the East Indies, the English would instead turn their attention to India, where the EIC would also gradually transition into a territorial power, just as the VOC had done before it. Over the course of 200 years, the Indian subcontinent would fall under the sway of first the EIC, and then the British Crown itself, after the company was nationalised in 1858. Indeed, India would become known as the jewel in the British crown, and the wealth it brought would drive British imperialism until the 20th century. Thus, the shattering of the Portuguese monopoly on the Cape Route to the east was the genesis of both the British and the Dutch empires, and the rise of these two dominions would, in turn, trigger the imperialist efforts of other European nations in Africa and Asia, thereby playing a major role in shaping the world into what it is today. And it was all made possible, for better or worse, by a very naughty Dutchman named Jan Hauken van Linschoten. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to see more videos, make sure you subscribe to the Real History channel. Alternatively, if you simply can't wait, you can head over to the Real History website for more articles covering a broad range of history topics. The link is in the description. I would also like to thank my patrons, whose support has been invaluable in getting this project off the ground. If you would also like to support Real History, you can head over to the Real History Patreon page via the link in the description. Once again, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.